So a few weeks ago I showed in another video uh, a preview of this uh, new 6502 computer system I've built um, and that's to replace the old one that wasn't working very well. And I said I'd follow up in another video with more of a description of what the motivation was behind it and how I got it to work. So the whole point of this system was to make it run at a very fast clock speed and the breadboard version here is running at 25 megahertz. The PCB version uh, runs at 32 megahertz at the moment, although I have had it running stably up to about 35 megahertz. And since I started learning electronics I've built probably five or six different 6502 based computer systems but I've never really cared about clock speed very much. I've increased the clock speed when necessary to do things like synchronize with the VGA pixel clock. Um, so I think my last one ran at uh, I think 6.3 megahertz, and I increased it again to 9 megahertz to work with SVGA, um, and that's about where it stopped being very stable. But clock speed itself has never really been my goal. I've, I've been much more interested in developing peripherals to plug into the computer rather than running the CPU itself as fast as possible. But nonetheless, I've had in the back of my mind a kind of design for what I would do if I did want to, uh, the computer to run quickly, um, and that's kind of what I've ended up producing here. So the motivation here was really just to sort of try out this design and see how it went. Um, I wasn't quite sure what to expect from it, um, but as I said, it's something I had in the back of my mind for a while, and it seemed worth having a go at. It has turned out to be very stable, so I'm pleased with that, and I will be using it moving forwards. If you're interested in reading more about this rather than just seeing it in video form, you could read the forum thread where I discussed this with the smart people at 6502.org forums, starting with the initial designs I had and then going through some modifications based on their feedback to what I've ended up with here. And I've also created a hackaday.io page for the project which has lots of information in written form and all of the schematics as well, so I'll link that in the description too for people who prefer to read things that way. Now the typical 6502 based system has the 6502 microprocessor and some RAM, some ROM and probably one or more I.O. devices such as a 6522 or an ACIA of some sort or something like that. And the 6502 uh, communicates with all these devices through the address bus, the data bus and a bunch of control signals. Now regarding how fast the system can run, it's important to note that some of these devices are faster than others. The 6502 CPU itself, at least the modern version, is rated for up to 14 MHz operation. Entry level RAM is typically rated at about 55 nanoseconds cycle time and that's equivalent to maybe 19 MHz. The commonly used AT28C256 EEPROMs are only rated for 150 nanosecond operation and that's about 7 MHz. Um, so that's much slower than the RAM, for example, and a lot of I.O. devices can vary quite a lot in their abilities. Now the 6502 CPU itself is actually quite overclockable, this is well known on the 6502.org forums, and you can also fairly easily get hold of faster RAM, so I'm using 12 nanosecond RAM rather than this 55 nanosecond that's typical. And there are other alternatives for the ROM as well, but it usually ends up being somewhat slower than the RAM. So now let's think a little bit about what the CPU is doing when it's executing our program and where the cycles are going. I'd estimate that about 50% of the time the 6502 is reading opcodes of instructions it has to run, and about 25% of the time it's reading data bytes that are also part of that same instruction stream, the operands, the parameters to the opcodes. And then of the rest of the time, maybe 20% of the time, it's uh, just reading or writing arbitrary RAM locations, data if you like, um, and then maybe 5% or less of the time it's performing some form of I.O. Now typically in a homebrew 6502 system, the program code and the uh, data bytes that are part of that program code are stored in ROM, and we've said that the ROM is not the fastest part of the system here. However, there's no reason that has to be run from ROM. We can copy that into RAM before running it, and then this way round, the only thing we really need to care about speed-wise is how fast we can run from RAM. All I've done is made a system which runs the CPU and the RAM at a very fast clock speed, and slows the clock down whenever it needs to talk to other devices. Incidentally, this technique is typically called clock stretching, because really what we're doing is we're taking a fast clock signal and stretching it out to slow it down. So let's have a look at what my clock stretching circuit actually does. Now during normal operation the CPU is running program code from RAM or accessing RAM locations and in these cases we want the clock to remain running at a fast rate straight from a crystal oscillator. 
However, when a ROM or I.O. operation is executed, we want to stretch the clock out to give the, the ROM or I.O. device time to execute the instruction and hold the CPU until the I.O. device is ready. In my first pass at this circuit, I arranged the memory map so that the RAM was in the bottom 32k of the address space and the whole of the top 32k of the address space was ROM and I.O. and this meant it was very easy to determine whether the CPU's current bus transaction was going to be a slow or a fast one. So it's purely dependent on the state of the A15 signal. If A15 is high, this is going to be a slow instruction and we're going to wait for the I.O. module to deal with the instruction, whereas if A15 is low, then it's a fast instruction and we can serve it straight from RAM. So what we do is at the very start of the CPU's phase 2, when the phase 2 clock rises, we look at the state of the A15 signal, and if the A15 signal is high, then we want to stretch the clock while we wait for the I.O. system to catch up. If the A15 signal was low at that point, then we don't want to stretch the clock, we just want it to run a normal length cycle. So what I do here is I use a D flip-flop to capture the state of the A15 signal at the point that the CPU clock would rise. The output of the D flip-flop is called I.O. wait, and this feeds back into an OR gate with the main clock to feed the CPU's Phi2 input. This means that if this is an I.O. operation, then at the start of phase 2 we latch the high state into this D flip-flop and the CPU's Phi2 will be held high until this D flip-flop gets cleared. And this is what stretches out the clock signal. The crystal oscillator can go low and high many times in the meantime, but the actual CPU clock will remain high until we've finished the I.O. operation. This is carefully timed so that this D flip-flop is only set or cleared while the raw clock input is already high because we don't want to set or clear this when the clock was low because that could cause really small run pulses on the clock which could, could upset the CPU. So this D flip-flop's clock input comes straight from the signal uh, which feeds Phi2. It's actually slightly delayed through a couple of OR gates here. And um, this I.O. wait signal goes off to a separate module of the computer, which I've called the I.O. module, and that includes the I.O. subsystem and the ROM. The I.O. module uses its own clock oscillator at a slower rate, and it contains the circuitry necessary to uh, pick up this I.O. wait signal and serve a regular bus cycle out of that clock to produce the right value on the data bus during a read operation, or to write the value that was on the data bus to whichever device was selected during a write operation. When the I.O. cycle is complete, the I.O. module signals back using this I.O. ready line uh, to tell the CPU module that it's OK to proceed now. The I.O. ready signal is resynchronized to the CPU module's clock, and this second D flip-flop will get cleared on the next rising edge of that input clock, uh, when the I.O. module is ready, and clearing this will then clear the I.O. wait flip-flop. As you can see, it's connected to the reset input of the I.O. wait flip-flop. So that very quickly clears I.O. wait, and that means that at the end of the current CPU cycle, uh, the CPU clock will no longer be held high. And this I.O. wait signal also feeds back to the I.O. module, which causes it to reset its I.O. ready signal and get back in a state where it's ready to receive another I.O. operation on the next bus cycle. So that's kind of the clock stretching circuit in a nutshell. This is this really is all there is to it here. The relative timing of these signals is really important though, and running at these clock speeds it has been quite difficult to get them happening at exactly the right times, hence some of the uh, OR gates here are just being used to delay signals a bit. I'm not, I'm not completely happy with the way that's landed, uh, but it does work how it is drawn here. The rest of the CPU module consists of the CPU, obviously, and the RAM, a bunch of bus transceivers, to separate the uh, I.O. module from the CPU module so that devices on the I.O. module's data and address buses don't bog down the buses of the CPU, and a little bit of glue logic here which controls the write and output enable signals on the RAM, and also controls the direction of the data bus transceiver because during an I.O. write operation we want that to work in one direction, and during an I.O. read operation we want it to work in the other direction. But that's kind of it for the CPU module. It sort of looks a, a bit like a regular 6502 system, just without any ROM, without any proper I.O., and with this kind of weird sort of clock stretching and an external interface that the I.O. module then plugs into.
We can also look at the I.O. module here, which is a, which is somewhat more complicated. Again, these schematics are all available on the Hackaday.io page, and it's probably the easiest way to see them. The I.O. module is, again, very much like its own 6502-based system, except this one doesn't have a CPU or RAM. All it has is ROM, I.O., and some decoding logic. It has its own clock up here, which is drawn as 4 MHz here. I'm actually using 8 MHz, I think, on the PCB version. And there's a PLD here, which is basically responsible for doing the first pass of address decoding. Uh, this is determining whether it's a ROM operation or an I.O. operation. Remember, we've already decided it is not a RAM operation, otherwise this part of the circuit would not be active. After the PLD, there's also a 74HDT138 decoder there, and that's used to decode which of eight I.O. devices the operation is destined for if it's not a ROM operation. The ROM itself is sort of in the bottom center of the diagram here, and uh, towards the right center you can see three sockets drawn in the circuit diagram here, and those are pluggable slots, a bit like uh, old-fashioned PC ISA bus slots, um, although it's a completely separate pinout that I've made up here. And these are for pluggable I.O. modules, so my serial module goes into one of those, I also have an SD card module that goes in another one, um, so it's just designed to be a sort of easily pluggable system. In the bottom centre there's a register which is used to drive some LEDs for debug purposes and in the bottom right there's a bus holding device. Now that's just a transceiver attached to the data bus uh, with its outputs fed back to the data bus through resistors and what this does is it means that if nothing is driving the data bus then the previous value that was on the data bus will be weakly driven onto the data bus by this transceiver. With the I.O. clock being asynchronous to the CPU clock, it's possible that the CPU is going to try and read the value off this bus at a time when nothing is actually driving it. So this just guarantees that after the selected device has finished writing a value onto the data bus, even if it stops driving the data bus, this chip will keep that value valid on the data bus indefinitely so that the CPU can read it later on. The little circuit in the top right is a soft power circuit which just provides these on and off buttons and the top center circuit is the reset circuit, which is fairly standard. So that's basically how this system works. The most complex thing about it is the fact that there are two different clock signals, and that does cause some complications. You need to worry about a thing called metastability, uh, which is probably worth looking up on Wikipedia if you want to know more about it. I kind of deal with it inside the PLD in the I.O. module, um, and the way I deal with the I.O. reset line is meant to kind of ha handle that on the way back in. But I'm not an expert on metastability, and I could well have got that wrong. So looking more closely at the breadboard version, um, over here is the 25 MHz VGA frequency oscillator, and in here is the 6502. Under these wires is uh, 64K of RAM. This one's actually been upgraded from my first iteration to have 64K of RAM. Uh, there's some ROM over here, um, there's an I.O. output display here, and a soft power circuit. Everything else is glue logic that makes it run. In addition to this I.O. port, uh, the breadboard version is also connected to the serial circuit that I showed in the last couple of videos, um, and that's all running off that same 4 MHz I.O. clock. Now the, now the breadboard version was originally a prototype uh, for the PCB version. Um, I was a bit surprised by how well the breadboard version worked at 25 megahertz, um, but the point was to prove the circuit out, and when it was, was working I designed and built the PCB version. Now this PCB version uses an 8 megahertz I.O. clock, um, and on the CPU module here there's uh, a 32 megahertz, 32.768 megahertz a crystal oscillator there at the moment, um, and that's what I'm using it with day to day. I have had it running faster than that actually using a programmable oscillator which is here. I'll put the part number on the screen. I don't recall exactly what it was. Um, DS1086Z or something like that. Um, but that's an SMD component in there and I made this kind of adapter board that adapts it out to have the same 4 pin footprint as a regular clock oscillator does. Um, um, and it's SPI programmable so I've got that wired up to like a, an Arduino Nano to, to program the frequency of the oscillator. And using this I've had it running stably at about 35 megahertz. I think it was actually 34.4.5. The oscillator doesn't run as fast as I program it for. But um, yeah, it was, it was quite stable at that speed. Uh, but for general operation I've gone back to a clock oscillator um, 
and 32.768 megahertz has proven very stable indeed for this for long periods of time. The uh, PCB version also has these I.O. slots on it uh, which allow plugging in I.O. components uh, which go onto the I.O. bus. Um, we have a serial circuit here and a 6522 VIA here. I've also designed uh, an SD card I.O. module um, but there's not really enough space in here to fit a third one in so I can't plug that in as well. Now in this version the CPU is also on this kind of adapter card thing which allows me to iterate the design more easily. I can uh, spin a new one, um, relay out some things or whatever and plug that in and I, in fact I already have done that once uh, because the, the initial version I got the pin out wrong on the on the CPU card and had to do a horrible bodge. Um, but yeah the CPU is in there and uh, on this side is the RAM chip that's also part, considered part of the CPU module. So that was a quick run through of how this new computer works, especially what makes it run so quickly and how the clock stretching circuit works. I hope you found it interesting and I'd encourage you to check out the Hackaday.io page for more details, especially if you are interested in looking more closely at the schematics because they'll be a lot easier to browse over there than they are on this YouTube video. And do let me know what you think in the comments either here or on Hackaday.io or on 6502.org forums. And of course I'll try to respond to any questions wherever you happen to write them. And I hope to see you next time when I will probably be running this computer through its paces, um, running some demo programs of what it can achieve at this clock speed. See you then.